Okay, so are you ready to dive into David Wong's John Dies at the End? This book, ah. Uh, it's wild. It's a wild riot, I'm telling you. Yeah. You weren't kidding. It's fascinating how Wong takes these average guys. Right. Right. Like David and John. Right. And just throws them head first into this reality that's constantly twisting and turning. It's like he takes the familiar yeah. and like peels it back to reveal something really unsettling underneath. Totally. And speaking of unsettling, can yeah. we talk about the soy sauce? Oh yeah. For a second. The soy sauce. This mysterious drug yeah. is like the key to unlocking all the weirdness. It is like he's asking like what if your perception of reality could be amplified but like with these bizarre and often terrifying side effects that, you know, yeah. it makes you question everything you see and experience. Yeah, exactly. Like that scene where David and John are called to a flooded basement. Oh, yeah. And remember, this guy's convinced there's a great white shark yes. down there. And it turns out to be a tiger shark. Yeah. Which, like, in a flooded basement... Oh, my gosh. ...might actually be worse, but the way that it just disappears, vanishes into thin air, mm. it's, it's that's what really sticks with you. It's like he's toying with you. Yeah. Like, what's real and what's not. Totally. And then there's David's encounter with Arnie Blondstone, the Wait. reporter who pulls a live centipede oh, God. from behind David's ear. It's such a... Talk about a party trick. Oh, my goodness. But it's such a brilliant example of misdirection. Yeah. You're so focused on the magic trick that you almost miss the deeper implication that maybe just maybe there's something more sinister at play. Oh, for sure. You know. And then there's poor Frank Wamba, the munitions inspector. Yes, sir. This sure. guy is obsessed with safety. Right. Terrified of a faulty bullet causing harm. Of and course. This, and, then, and, and then what happens? Then... He's taken out by something completely beyond his comprehension. I know. It's as if Wong is saying that no amount of caution can prepare you for the moment that reality itself starts to unravel. Yeah, so how do we even begin to make sense of these altered states of perception? Right. Are these hallucinations? Are these drug-induced states? Or is Wong hinting at something far stranger? That's the beauty of it. He doesn't give us the easy answers, you know? He wants us to sit with the unease, to mm -hmm. consider the possibility that maybe just maybe there's more to our reality than meets the eye. Which is terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time, right? Well, this idea that we're only scratching the surface yeah. of what's really out there. Totally. And it's not just the soy sauce that bends reality in this book. Oh, no. Things get even weirder. Yeah. Even more fluid as the story unfolds. Exactly. We start to see instances where the very fabric of what we consider real starts to break down. Like John Marnie being able to make calls on disconnected cell phones? Ah. Even after, well, you know. It defies logic. Mm, right. It's as if he's tapped into some kind of communication beyond our understanding, transcending the limitations of technology as we know it. And then there are these weird time slips, like the missing half hour that both John and David experience. Yes. They lose track of time, right. have these gaps in their memories. Yeah. Is it the soy sauce messing with them? Right. Or is something else manipulating time itself? It's interesting you say manipulating time because... What's unsettling here is that Wong doesn't just present these events as hallucinations. Right. He wants us to consider the possibility that our perception of time, this linear progression we take for granted, might be far more malleable than we realize. Whoa. And then there are those characters that are just gone. You're right. Based, their um, pasts rewritten as if they never existed. That's where it gets truly chilling. Yeah. It's one thing to experience these shifts in perception yourself. But to have reality itself manipulated around you, to have people vanish without a trace, mm -hmm. that's a whole other level of unsettling. It's like Wong is hinting at the possibility of alternate dimensions or even simulated realities where our very existence could be manipulated at whim. And that uncertainty, that fear of the unknown, is a theme that runs throughout the book. It Wong wants us to feel that sense of unease, to question the very foundation of our reality. And just when you think things couldn't get any weirder, we're introduced to Korok. Oh, boy. This yeah. isn't just some monster in the closet. No. Right? This is a whole different kind of threat. Korok represents something far more insidious, far more invasive. Right. This isn't just a being. It's a force of nature, mm. a collective consciousness that's constantly growing, 
absorbing minds and power. And with it comes this whole hierarchy of beings, each one more disturbing than the last. Yeah. Like shitload. Oh my God. The entity inhabiting Justin White. Even the name itself is unsettling. I know. But the way Wong describes shitload, this being of pure chaos and malice constantly shifting and changing, it's a brilliant representation of pure, unadulterated evil. And then there's that image of the rots and how they infest their victims. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Wong's descriptions are incredibly vivid. Hmm. He doesn't shy away from the horror. He wants you to feel the visceral disgust, the sheer terror of these creatures burrowing into people, taking them over from the inside out. And let's not forget the shadow people. Oh God, no. These tall, featureless figures lurking in the darkness, always watching. Always watching. It's like they embody that primal fear of the unknown, the things that go bump in the night. What's fascinating is how Wong draws upon these ancient myths and folklore right these universal archetypes of fear and dread these aren't just random creatures they tap into our deepest fears about the things that lurk just beyond our perception right it's like he's reminding us that even in a world of technology and reason there are still things we can't explain forces beyond our control and that's where the real terror lies absolutely you know it's funny or maybe terrifying is a better word but David's struggle to trust his own memories really got to me. Yeah. In a world flooded with information, it's like we're all battling our own version of the soy sauce, you know? It's a fantastic parallel. Think about it. Yeah. We're bombarded with news, social media opinions, constantly vying for our attention. Right. It's hard to know what's real, what's been manipulated, what we've just convinced ourselves of. Exactly. Yeah. And then Wong throws in those moments where David's memories are hazy, yeah. particularly around Amy Sullivan's disappearance right. and that symbol of pie popping up oh, yeah. around those under Korof's influence. Yeah. It makes you wonder, like, what can we really trust even within our own minds? It's this insidious idea that even our past, the bedrock of our identity, could be manipulated or even erased. Right. It's deeply unsettling, this notion that we might not even be in control of our own narratives. And then the climax at the Luxor Hotel. Oh, yeah. Talk about a mind bender. I know. It's presented as this epic showdown between good and evil, but then reality itself gets a subtle rewrite. Right, yeah. How do we even process that? It's as if Wong is asking... Who gets to decide what's real? Right. On the surface, it's a wild battle with monsters and mayhem. Yeah. But underneath, it speaks to this very real fear of hidden agendas of powerful forces shaping our world without our knowledge or consent. And no one even remembers the true chaos that unfolded except for our main characters. And so it makes you think like how much of our own history, our collective memory has been manipulated in ways we can't even grasp. Wow. It's a lot to unpack. It really is. You know, it's not just about external forces manipulating reality. Right. Wong also explores how we as individuals right. shape our own perceptions through the choices we make. Like when David chooses to believe John's story about being eaten by a monster, yeah. even though it sounds completely bonkers. I know. That's some serious faith in your friend. <laughs> <laughs> but it speaks to a deeper truth. Yeah. Every day we're deciding what we'll accept, what we'll question, right. and what we'll flat out ignore. Sure. Sometimes even believing the unbelievable, yeah. especially if it's tied to someone we trust, feels less scary than facing a mundane truth that leaves us empty. It's that classic human need to find meaning. Right. Even in the most absurd situations. But Wong doesn't let us off easy, does he? He constantly <laughs> reminds us that the search for meaning can lead to some pretty dark places. And that's where the brilliance of John Dies at the End really shines through. Yeah. It's not just a horror novel. It's a reflection of our own anxieties, our own struggles to find our footing in a world that often feels chaotic and uncertain. Totally. And it's a... Uh, like he's holding up this funhouse mirror... Yes. ...to our deepest fears about reality being far more fragile than we'd like to believe. And it's a... Uh, but even with all the darkness... Yeah. Wong masterfully weaves in this thread of humor that's somehow both dark and hilarious. Absolutely. It's that dark, cynical wit that keeps you from completely spiraling into existential dread. Right. You know, <laughs> like when David and John are trying to figure out what to do with a car completely overtaken by a pulsating mass of roaches. Oh, God. And John's solution? What? Douse the whole thing in beer. Oh, my God. Right. It's absurd. It's hilarious. And yet it speaks to that very human need to find a coping mechanism. Right. A moment of levity, right. even in the face of pure nightmare fuel. It's like 
what else can you do but laugh? Exactly. When reality throws something that absurd at you. I know, right? It's the kind of humor that makes the horror bearable. Makes yeah. you feel like you're not alone in thinking this is messed up. Precisely. It's a reminder that even when everything is falling apart, those shared moments of laughter, those connections we made through humor, mm -hmm. they help us hold on to our humanity. And there's this underlying message that even when facing the unknown, the truly terrifying, we still have that capacity for joy, for finding absurdity in the midst of chaos. It's what keeps us going. It's the kind of resilience that makes you root for David and John, even when they're making terrible decisions and facing down creatures that make your skin crawl. I know. But let's be honest, sometimes Wong's humor is downright jarring. Oh, absolutely. You know. Like when John tries to communicate with that thing, yes. part spider, part beak, all kinds of wrong. Oh my God. By sticking a toaster in its face. I know. Uh -huh. It's such a bizarre, unexpected move. I know. And yet it somehow works. And that's where the humor lies in the absurdity of it all. This idea that sometimes the most ridiculous solution is the only one that makes sense in a world gone mad. It's like Wong is giving us permission to embrace the absurd, to find humor in the darkest of situations because maybe just maybe that's the key to survival right you know it's a powerful reminder that even when we're confronting our deepest fears that instinct to find something familiar something to laugh at well that's what makes us human yes but it's a double-edged sword right because that clinging to normalcy that need for things to make sense yeah, yeah it also makes us vulnerable sure we become so focused on finding a rational explanation we miss the truly bizarre reality unfolding around us exactly and that's where the real horror sets in right not just in the creatures and the gore right but in the realization that our own need for order for logic can blind us to the truth it's what makes John Dies at the End such a compelling read. This masterful blend of humor, horror, and what the heck did I just read <laughs> moments. It really does. It stays with you long after you finish the book. It's a testament to Wong's skill as a writer, his ability to tap into our deepest fears and anxieties right. while still leaving us wanting more. You know what really stuck with me, even more than the creepy crawlies and the reality glitches, was... What's that, that idea of choice. Okay. Like David and John get this terrifying peek behind the curtain. Yeah. They see the true nature of things, and uh -huh. then they have to decide, like, what to do with that knowledge. It's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff. It really is. It's that age-old question, isn't it? Right. Ignorance is bliss, but what happens when you can't unsee the truth? Do you hide from it, pretend it's not there, or do you face it head on, even if it costs you everything? Oh, right. David and John in their own messed up way, choose to fight. They do. And it's not like they're these fearless warriors, right. right? They're constantly questioning, second guessing, just trying to survive. Right. But they keep going. They put themselves on the line to protect others, even when those people are clueless about the danger they're in. That's what makes them so compelling, though. Right. They're not these untouchable figures with all the answers. Right. They're slawed. They're sarcastic. Yeah. They make terrible jokes at the worst possible times. Yeah. They're relatable. They're relatable. Man. Exactly. It's like Wami saying you don't need superpowers. Right. You don't need a fancy costume to make a difference. You don't have to be bitten by a spider. Right. Sometimes all it takes is the willingness to stand up and say, nope, not today, monster. That's right. Even when you're scared out of your mind. And that resonates, doesn't it? It does. This idea that heroism isn't about being fearless. It's about pushing through the fear mm -hmm. because something matters more. Right. And in David and John's case, it's about finding meaning in a world that increasingly seems to lack it. And they kind of find that meaning in a way through this fighting against these forces that are trying to unravel everything. They right. become these unlikely protectors. Yeah. The guardians against the darkness, even if no one else knows it. It speaks to our innate need to make sense of the chaos to find something bigger than ourselves. Right. Even if that something is as terrifying as an interdimensional being trying to consume our reality. And then there's that ending. Talk about leaving you with questions. David and John come back from their final showdown, but things are off. Right. And you're left wondering, like, did they really win? Or is this just another level of messed up they haven't fully grasped yet? It's brilliant. Wong doesn't tie everything up in a neat little bow. He leaves that unsettling possibility hanging in the air yeah. that the battle for reality, for sanity, for our own minds, yeah. even, is never truly over. It's like he's saying, stay vigilant, 
question everything. Right. And even when you think you've won, keep looking over your shoulder. Yes. Because the moment you let your guard down, that's when the really weird stuff happens. That's when the truly weird stuff tends to happen. That's right. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, this has been quite the deep dive. It has been fun. It has been a fascinating, terrifying, hilarious ride. Absolutely. And you know what? Laughter curiosity, a healthy dose of skepticism. <laughs> Those are our best weapons against the unknown. Well said. This has been a fascinating deep dive. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and remember, sometimes the truth is stranger and a lot funnier than fiction. That's right. Good night, everybody.